Um, so welcome today to today's Implementation Science Initiative Seminar Series. Um, again, sponsored by the Implementation Science Initiative at the CTSA and also the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Um, we are really thrilled today um, to have my friend and colleague, Dr. Pajakta Adsul, join us. Um, Dr. Adsul and I have been working together a couple years now. Um, and at the time, she was part of the NCI Implementation Science uh, team. She was a fellow there at um, NCI. And now she is a faculty member and assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine um, at the University of New Mexico and also part of their Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, and she does amazing work in both global and domestic settings with mixed methods and really thinking about implementation and implementation strategies um, with a health equity lens. Um, she also received her medical training in India and her doctorate in public health at St. Louis University College for Public Health and Social Justice. So I'm super thrilled to have her join us. Um, just a reminder that um, this is being recorded um, and we will make this available. So I am going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Atsul. Hi, Thank everyone. You. It is amazing to join you guys today. Um, for this talk, I've been able to sneak into some conversations uh, in the past, uh, given our uh, collaborative efforts on promoting health equity and implementation science. So very excited to talk to you today. Um, thanks so for much for the invitation. I'm excited. This is an amazing uh, little group of folks that are really um, interested in implementation science. And I was talking to Rachel earlier today, and I asked her if uh, we've talked about the cancer side of things. So. I'm very excited to introduce and uh, sort of uh, uh, elaborate on this space for implementation science and equity that I've been uh, sort of involved with for the last um, six or seven years now. Um, and wanted to uh, use some of my own examples from my own research to exemplify what we've been writing about very prolifically in the last year or so, um, so that it sort of makes sense to uh, bring a little bit of, uh, um, you know, clarity to the abstract concepts of health equity. So um, very informal presentation, a lot of photos in here. So feel free to, let's try to have a really nice rich discussion at the end so that we can uh, really tease through some of these concepts that I'm trying to present to you. So I want to begin by acknowledging why uh, a focus on health equity is important for me. And um, it has, uh, I have to acknowledge, much of my experience has been shaped by growing up and living as a young adult and then practicing primary care as a physician uh, and also at the same time identifying as a Dalit in India. So that really shaped some of my early experiences and made me really focus on uh, approaches that were equitable in research. Um, and I've because of my clinical training and then research interests, always had this at the back of my mind, what can we actually implement in global and local healthcare and community settings? So that has really dominated lots of my research approaches. And I have to acknowledge that today I'm a recent citizen uh, of the United States, a faculty at a research institute, and my home and my work sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblos of Sandia. And I have to acknowledge uh, they are amazing contributions to the betterment of this land, and I, I uh, am committed to contribute to those acknowledgements and um, continuing to betterment of these communities in this space. So for me, it has been a focus, of, a focus on equity um, and not really a focus on disparities, like where are the differences, but really what can we do in an equitable way to improve implementation, to improve access to services, to improve uptake of services. And really strongly in the last few years has been uh, a focus to continue having this conversation because we don't have solutions that are exactly applicable in all contexts right now, but we have to continue to have the space and these conversations uh, to make progress in this space. So that's where I come from. Uh, but today I wanted to, just to give you a roadmap of what we'll be talking about is, I'll introduce a little bit about the Implementation Science Consortium in Cancer. Uh, much of my work has been in cervical cancer prevention, uh, both globally uh, and in India uh, specifically. And then how I've brought some of that learnings that I had at the global field 
to some of my national work over here in New Mexico. So very introductory. <laughs> So let's talk uh, uh, a little bit about the Implementation Science Consortium in cancer. Um, this was a brainchild of the NCI Implementation Science team, and I was very fortunate to be a postdoc during uh, that time in the team. So uh, was tuned into these conversations and the thought leaders that were speaking about why this was important to bring together uh, a community that could um, you know, really think about the key challenges, develop areas of research that could advance implementation science in cancer control. So in 2019, this is a picture from 2019, unfortunately, 2020, we were not together. We were a, a larger number than the 107 that are pictured over here. We were around 700 people in 2020. Uh, but we represented uh, several institutions across uh, the US and, and beyond actually. Um, to think about this together. So this is a very neat initiative with the objectives of creating uh, public goods for implementation science, fostering collaborations, improving networking and dissemination, um, and targeting um, underrepresented areas. And what's not shown on this slide is continuing the dialogue to, to bring together investigators, not just that are funded from specific grants, but also uh, broadly thinking about what is it that we need for this field. And what you're seeing in the pictures on the right is um, the steering committee that guided the efforts for the 2019. Unfortunately, I didn't have all of the pictures for the 2020, but they reflect similar uh, folks. Uh, you can see Rachel is on there too, um, who have thought about uh, these seven, and I think there were two additional ones that came into being in 2020 but these seven areas for focus for implementation science. And I and Rachel were um, really fortunate to lead the conversations around health equity and context in 2019 and then in 2020 with an extended team that I'll present later. But similar to 2019 and 2020, our big focus areas were to answer the questions, how can the implementation science community advance and make more explicit the incorporation of health equity and context across cancer prevention control research? And how do we improve health equity across cancer continuum through an application of implementation science? So the way the consortium was designed, we did like the first day of brainstorming idea generation and then went to day two with a real um, um, close focus on the ideas that were generated and then prioritized what the field should take up. So here are some of the public goods that we had come up with. And we were thinking about, you know, uh, could we present uh, sort of equity considerations for the existing implementation models, theories and frameworks, and also strategies in this space. We had this um, commitment to not come up with another model, another framework, but to revisit some existing ones in how we can incorporate uh, uh, equity within that space. And you've seen Rachel's new uh, framework. Uh, some of you must have seen Rachel's new framework that has taken re-aim to incorporate sustainability and equity within it. Eva Woodward has come out with like a health equity implementation framework. And then there is another one uh, where uh, Anna Bauman had taken Proctor's implementation science framework and adapted it to reflect equity. So that's something that we discussed at the DNI workshop uh, that we just did in uh, December, uh, but happy to share those uh, slides if, th if that is of interest to uh, folks on this call as well. We also thought about a landscape assessment of methods for what we mean by contextual inquiry. We thought about uh, building uh, a, a understanding of health equity into the implementation science definitions, uh, some checklists and program announcements as well. So that it would uh, not just be something for um, funders and uh, organizations to consider when they are reviewing proposals, but also for us as researchers and institutes that are applying to do some of this work. There were similar flavors in the public goods that were discussed in 2020 as well. So which actually showcases that um, you know, so much of this work remains to be done and uh, there is commitment and energy and momentum around this work. Um, so we had a really um, 
productive conversation, recognizing the realities of 2020 and how health inequities have been uh, highlighted yet again in the pandemic, in uh, the social justice movements around um, our law enforcement agencies. So that really was showcased very well in the 2020 discussions and we we recommitted to thinking about equity related methods and measures for implementation studies, revisiting the theories, models and frameworks on a broader scale. Um, and also thinking as we are thinking about theories, models and frameworks, how do they link to implementation strategies, right? That promote equity. We're also working uh, on thinking about what are the training needs for scientists who want to incorporate health equity and implementation science within this, within their research. And then, you know, uh, a lot of uh, work is continuing to be done in this, I, this space of com community engagement and stakeholder engagement. So we can't, we can't do much of this work alone uh, in, in our silos. How do we build those relationships with our important stakeholders? But what does that mean? How does that look? What are the methods? Is there a rigorous systematic science behind this and the value add can be uh, demo and that way we can demonstrate the value add for these approaches. So I was joined with like amazing folks from uh, uh, in this work, for, uh, including Stephanie Wheeler, April O, and Ariala, uh, who all like five of us together were able to um, work through some of these uh, project ideas. There was a lot of good engagement and some really important takeaways that happened over the 2019 and I think similarly in the 2020 meeting. The idea of not exacerbating disparities, it's not a checkbox, but uh, needs active planned program of science. Um, we, there was a lot of discussion around we as researchers not uh, uh, you know, condescending our collaborators uh, especially when there are like power hierarchies involved and being cognizant of those uh, things. And my favorite one is there are lots of cool and smart people like all of us <laughs> that do implementation science. So I think there's, it's been, uh, I was saying to some of my colleagues today morning, it's been nice to have the space to discuss these issues. It's, they're not issues, but strategies to overcome the inequities that have been persistent in our research for so long. So I encourage you to all uh, continue to stay involved in some of these conversations if that is of interest. Uh, we have a very active Twitter presence. <laughs> we all acknowledge it. Uh, we are um, on hashtag MPSI. Uh, a lot of this gets distributed. At NCI, we just released the 2020 summary report uh, for the conversations that happened at the consortium. Uh, a plug-in for the Cancer Prevention and Control Network that brings together lots of these thought leaders in this in the cancer prevention space uh, through the Cancer Prevention uh, CPCRN network. Um, and then there is this newer initiative of implementation science centers and cancer control that um, I've linked to that you could follow along for some of their broader activities uh, that are ongoing. So with that background, um, I wanted to bring us, I wanted to introduce my area of research and like give you some examples from my own work that might uh, promote your thinking in terms of like, how do we actually take these ideas and start applying in our own research and in our own work? Um, so of course I'm not, this wasn't uh, as perfect as I would like it to be, but you know, um, a good start and has helped me learn about some of these basics of, uh, uh, equity research and disparities uh, work as well as community-based participatory research approaches. So showcasing some of that. So worldwide, uh, cervical cancer uh, tends to be amongst the top four. Uh, still, we've known that we've had effective evidence-based interventions for cervical cancer for now, I think in the 60s, since the 60s, and yet we continue to see cervical cancer rates um, really high across the world. And this disparity is really exaggerated when you look at the global map of incidence rates and low and middle income countries tend to have uh, the disproportionate burden of cervical cancer, um, not only in terms of incidence, but also in terms of mortality. 
So uh, this continues to be a larger um, commitment issue for a lot of countries to work towards how do we get to um, a global elimination challenge that the WHO has put forward for, especially with the focus on low and middle income countries. We know what we can do about this issue, right? Like we have primary preventive interventions, we have secondary prevention interventions, we know treatment, treatment works. And yet we continue, continue to see um, high levels of incidence and mortality rates in these countries. Um, and I think the bigger question over there is, even though we have these interventions, we know they work, are they being equitably implemented for populations at risk? And so with that question, my focus has been on screening for early detection of cancer. And if you think about the process of screening, it isn't just about giving the test, it is about like making sure that the screen negatives and the screen positives go through appropriate diagnosis while avoiding overdiagnosis go through appropriate treatment while avoiding overtreatment, right? So there are specific buckets. Within these broad buckets, there are more ideas that need to be thought through when you're thinking about a process for screening. Each of these steps also have multi-level influences on cancer care delivery. So um, some of you might recognize this onion model of like the individual patient and the quality of care that they receive, the care that they receive might have influences from their family, their social supports, the providers of the team, the organization, and then state, local, and national policies, which, which all collectively have an impact, but also within the levels can have uh, uh, interesting interactions that lead to uh, different impacts on the care that is delivered. So there's a lot of complexity in studying implementation for screening. Uh, uptake, is, uptake of cancer screening is dependent on behavior and delivery of services. You have to think about integrating clinical and clinical services with community priorities that the clinic is responsible for. And as I had just, I just discussed, it's a dynamic context with um, a lot of moving parts and the multiple levels of influences and interactions within them. So with that, I'll give you an example of how we approach this issue, uh, this space in, in India. Uh, and I had the uh, wonderful fortune of uh, um, collaborating with a community-based organization in India that was working in rural and tribal communities and had some funding from the Poverty International Center as a global health fellow to do some of this work. Um, and in India, the cervical cancer burden is, a, is a, a pretty extreme. It is the second most common cancer, very, very closely tied with breast cancer at the back uh, for women in India. And the recent National Family Health Survey that was done puts current estimates at around 30% for screening. And we genuinely, a lot of us researchers in this space think that that was an over-exaggeration. Uh, it, it's still lower than 30% even in many of these rural and tribal communities. And I'll show next, we have several screening tests for cervical cancer. So within the development of cervical cancer, um, you know, from a normal cervix to HP, to having HPV infection, because we now know that you have to have uh, HPV infection for the development of cervical cancer, like 100% of cervical cancer cases are tied into HPV infection. So that leads to cervical dysplasia leading to cancer. We are more familiar in the US with pap smears that are widespread and effective in the United States and have really resulted in a lower, um, uh, incidence and mortality rate for all of us in, in the Western world. Um, there are newer tests, the HPV DNA tests that will help identify the HPV infection. They're very accurate, uh, but very, very costly and require a high functioning lab <laughs> to be able to analyze these uh, results. One of the newer tests uh, that you might have commonly heard in the media referred to as the vinegar test is the visual inspection test that allows a physician to apply uh, vinegar on the women's cervix, wait for a couple of minutes. And if there are any cervical dysplastic changes, it turns, the, the area turns white in color. So it's a very quick, low, low expense 
uh, test uh, with very minimal setup requirement, but a pelvic exam required and good magnification and light source required to see these, but it's doable, it's feasible in many of the Indian settings. So with this background, we conducted a systematic review to say, okay, we've known about this test, how many places have done this and what have been the big facilitators or barriers in implementing this test in, in rural uh, and urban settings in India. So we specifically targeted India. And for, we saw around 12 unique uh, studies that were doing this test through 20 published articles. Uh, some of the facilitators included, uh, it was quick to train the providers. It was, you know, a health education was enough. Screening and treating was great because you could like see the lesion and you could thermoablate it immediately if the woman agrees for a treatment, which is really good to do it in the same visit, which would reduce your loss to follow up. Some of the barriers we saw were, there were a lot of logistical challenges because um, you had to have your cryotherapy equipment at the same time in the community setting. Um, women didn't quite, weren't quite prepared to talk about treatment when they were just coming in for a usual screening test and wait a minute, what? Like I'm supposed to get treated? <laughs> and you can almost imagine that uh, identifying this white lesion on like a one by one centimeter cervix with low light conditions can uh, requires a steep learning curve for some providers. So not all providers really quickly caught onto it and it was hard. It, in some studies they showed that it was hard for providers to accurately uh, discern who has uh, cervical cancer dysplasia versus who doesn't. And I was working with the Public Health Research Institute of India that I'm showing you, it's in the lower tip of in South India, um, who were delivering the VIA services free of cost in the community for the women. And yet we were seeing very low uptake. So you might assume, one might assume that, oh, we are, giving these services free of cost and why are we still seeing no women come for this service? So we were, uh, I was able to work with the leadership in the Institute, some of the community physicians and the community uh, health workers to come up with some community-based research approaches that would help us understand why this was an issue for this community. Uh, our approach was involving multiple stakeholders. We talked to women in the community, we talked to community workers, we talked to physicians. Um, and I'll just show you a snapshot of what we did with women. <laughs> so we were able to do a photo voice project with so many of these women um, because we really thought that it was a very complex issue. It was a sensitive issue. We wouldn't understand why or why not they come for cervical cancer screenings. What are some things that get into the way? Um, and we I al also wanted this to be an action oriented project. So many of these women that we enrolled in our uh, photo voice project, I can tell you that have uh, over the last few years have gone on to become really important clear voices in the community because they had like this in-depth understanding of what do we mean by cervical cancer health, cervical health. So we enrolled 14 women in this uh, project. They were all not health workers, but community workers. They were engaged in the community in some developmental, some uh, infrastructure development or some other um, sector of public work. Um, they, we did some data collection over three months. It was an interesting process. I won't delve into the details of how we got them to understand what is photo voice and what are photographs and why we, because you know we are used to taking photographs to celebrate a moment like our son's first birthday versus photo voice is kind of asking you to say, what is the actionable, what is the important barrier that you need to understand for your health in this context? So we had a little bit of a learning curve, got, went through that process, but then once they got it, we had 160 photographs with meaningful um, uh, narratives behind them that these women really felt passionate about. We did like a thematic analysis on them and involved them in giving us interpretations of what it meant to synthesize all of these photos together and come up with themes. And I'll just give you a quick snapshot, but we've just published this paper um, with like more details on this work. 
So one of these photographs that the women took was this perceived influence of their families, their husbands in particular, and their mother-in-laws in their family. So this woman took a picture of the, the gate in this community that made her feel like she couldn't step out of this gate without her permission from without permission from husband from her husband or her mother-in-law to even take care of her own health. So these are very deeply rooted issues in the community uh, for many of these women. Uh, one of the members who was uh, identified as a Muslim um, in in this group uh, because Muslims are the ones in India that uh, use cemeteries for their uh, final rites. Um, in the Hindu culture, uh, cremation is the way people finalize their, uh, or go through their final rites. But for her, this was an important uh, picture to showcase that if I am, all, I, and I think I remember her saying, we are all going to go and die. So why undergo a screening test and create like more trouble for the final phases of my life where I will not have enough money to support my treatment. My family won't have enough money to support my treatment and cancer kills is the common perception. So there is no prevention test, there's no screening test that can help with that fate that I have to live with. Um, and then this was a very interesting picture by um, one of the women in the, in the project. She said that the fruit might look very proper from the outside, but when you peel it, there could be rot inside. And that just shows you how much even though women understand this in the community, there is a very strong hesitancy for women to come and undergo pelvic exams in the community. Um, maybe messages like this could help motivate women in the community that you know you could look beautiful from the outside, but you really need to have a doctor look into uh, your health issues um, uh, if there is uh, if there are any. We, as a part of this photo voice project, we were able to support these 14 women to go out and conduct community displays uh, of these photographs that we took with like, if you can see over here with the narrative description of each photograph. Um, and we invited a lot of physicians in the community to come participate in these conversations. And it was wonderful to have uh, some of, to watch some of these health workers become sort of peer advocates for this issue in their community. And I can tell you that even five years after this, four years after this project, we've continued to have these interactions and they've been wonderful role models in the community um, to spread the word. And the lowest, lowest pictures show you the district health officer was in attendance. All of the community health workers were in attendance. So it really sparked a broad dialogue in the community for why this uh, is an important issue to focus on. I'm not showing you what we learned from what we did with the clinicians and the community health workers, but overall uh, from the photo voice project, we learned on the left side, a strong hesitancy for pelvic exam. From the physicians, we learned that the healthcare system was very overburdened for delivering symptom-based care. So if you had a cold or a cough, physicians knew what to do with it. But if you were asymptomatic, and a prevention paradigm was required to like refer you to a screening test that was quite hard for them to make that jump. Um, so clearly a lot of need for provider training in that space. And community health workers kept noting the barriers in terms of motivating women for pelvic exams. So we were like, maybe visual inspection methods are not the best for this population, right? Went back to the drawing board and this was what our, what our options were. But might there be another option to think about in these communities? And um, these were self-collected sampling uh, devices for doing the HPV test that were cheaper than the HPV DNA tests that are prevalent in a lot of the Western uh, countries. But we, were, we could give a brush to a woman and she could collect her own sample so she didn't have to go through a full pelvic exam to do these tests. So we thought, well, could we try that option for this community? And we were able to do a cross-sectional study uh, uh, to demonstrate the feasibility of implementing something like this in rural and tribal areas using the community setting that I was working with as the hotspot for delivering these tests. And so we did a cross-sectional study with 502 women um, over a period of six months um, 
that we were able to recruit them into six months. And I'll show you a photo essay, essay of how we did this. But what we were most proud about is that 70% of our sample was from the lower caste communities which are communities uh, that usually do not have access to care, do not have any uh, regular physician, physical, uh, physician provider delivering care to them um, and not enough systems within these settings. So really, really rural parts of um, uh, South India that we were approaching. So just a photo, I said, this is how we would load up our uh, little bus, uh, little car. Um, with a nurse, with a with a, a lab assistant, and with social workers, and on tow, uh, and me, <laughs> we would create these awareness campaigns and have them select a community site where we could have access to running water, access through roads, and like access to um, uh, toilet facilities for the women to uh, have uh, undergo these tests. Uh, we would do some group inter introductions, we would do a group health education sort of campaign, ask for consent. Um, they would all gather together um, in, in, in this community site. We would make sure we did some good advertising in the previous few days. Um, we did, um, our team members administered ta tablet assisted surveillance questionnaires. So that was a really new thing for our research team. Like, could we do this quickly in the community so that we didn't have to uh, um, slow down the process? Um, we collected a lot of behavioral and physical measures. That's me being useful to my research team, <laughs> um, uh, trying to help wherever I can. Uh, our nurses, we were able to set up the whole community site to make it sterile and make it clean for this one space. Did the blood draws, did an oral exam or clinical breast exam. And then our lab assistants were helpful in explaining the self-sampling procedure and collecting the samples for uh, the, for the self-sampling. What was unique about our study is that some of the behavioral measures that we were able to collect in our study were quite higher from the, the state level measures. And when I spoke to our community uh, uh, participants or our, our, uh, my advisory folks, they told me that the way we collected the data, which was so approachable, which was so unjudgmental, allowed women to talk about their smokeless tobacco habits, uh, allowed uh, people to give a blood pressure reading under a you know, calmer environment and actually accurately dis describe that. We saw a 7.6% positivity rate in our studies, which is pretty comparable to other studies uh, for HPV DNA in India. And amongst our data, 50% were in that age group of 30 to 39. So hopefully these are the patients where the HPV infections regress and we really have to worry more about the 31% and the 19% over here, or the 50% that, that are above the age of 40. But here's where the challenge started, right? Like when we started following up these women, that's when we realized there weren't good guidelines to guide us. Well, now we've tested them with HPV DNA. What do we do next? Should we do a PAP test? Should we do a VI test? What, what, what uh, is the next follow-up test for these women? And that made it so complicated because also these women were immigrant um, farmer, migrant farmer workers. So some of them were lost to follow up. Some of them did not have the ability to come um, multiple visits for the multiple follow-up tests. And that really led me to think about, you know, how important implementation issues are in some of these communities. You could have the most novel test, you could have the most amazing setup and you could create all of this, but yet you would not be able to uh, have the outcomes associated with that if you don't think of the whole process and the complexity associated with that. So that really has, um, uh, you know, we were able to follow up a lot of women and we continue to deliver these screening tests at the community site. Um, they've been uh, grateful. Uh, I've been uh, grateful for them to allow me to keep engaging with, these, uh, with this cohort that we started and keep helping with uh, messaging in some of the educational materials at the community-based organization. We've been able to set up the whole lab in the community setting and uh, continue to deliver the self-sampling tests in the, in the community. And what is neat is this organization has now uh, become an advisor to the National Cancer Screening Program that
that is run by the government of India. So even the small demonstration pilot, pilot study has been able to contribute to the larger conversation in the space for the government. We continue to explore stigma around the cancer diagnosis. Like I showed you in the Photo Voice project, this is a very huge issue in this community and how can we start to disentangle this and really promote a prevention paradigm in this, uh, in this space. Um, this has also allowed me to contribute to uh, this global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer with the WHO where they've rested their strategy on three different pillars. One is 90% vaccination of uh, girls below the age of 15 years, 70% uh, of women that are uh, to be screened uh, with a high performance test, and 90% of the women identified with cervical disease receive the treatment. And I've been really contributing most extensively to the implementation work group where we are thinking about you know, specific implementation strategies that could help with the adoption and scale up of these programs, uh, increase uptake, increase retention of test positive women in care, and uh, you know, thinking about multi-level systems like the providers and the systems in which they cater to and what are some implementation strategies over there. So you know, wonderful work group members that we are collectively bringing our field experience and our research experience to bear to mind as we develop these recommendations through the WHO for, uh, with a specific focus on uh, low and middle income countries. So uh, exciting stuff, stay tuned um, for what comes next. Uh, you know, this is, it's nice to be speaking about cervical cancer in February's Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. So there's a lot of action on Twitter right now on this too. Um, I want to uh, just quickly showcase a project that we are, we are taking on in New Mexico, um, just because I, this was one of my ways of showing how a global health fellow working in India in rural and tribal communities uh, can bring so much to the space of our local needs, even in the backyard too. So the lessons, the methods, the strategies I learned in doing this work in India, I've been able to bring to bear in some of our uh, discussions over here in New Mexico as I joined the faculty. And we were very fortunate, I was very fortunate to be funded through an internal grant from the American Cancer Society to conduct some work, some formative work uh, in terms of sexual and gender diverse individuals in New Mexico. I must acknowledge though that I don't, um, identify as one of the community uh, from sexual and gender diverse communities in New Mexico. But I am very committed to promoting equity in all of the work that I do and um, have engaged with amazing collaborators, including physicians and researchers and community members and advisory board members that represent individuals uh, from these communities and um, continue to acknowledge my position uh, and, and acknowledge that I want to learn and do better for these communities. While at NCI, I was fortunate to work with the United States Preventive Services and contribute to, to the 2018 guideline development for cervical cancer screening. And if you haven't looked at their methodological um, data on how they come to these decisions of what is important for the population and what is not, it's an amazing read to know how systematically uh, and uh, they assess the evidence uh, about reduction in mortality and morbidity to, um, uh, for each of the screening tests that they promote, and that is linked directly to insurance policies, right? Um, so in 2018, the recommendations were uh, broadened to include HPV DNA tests for cervical cancer as well for women. And this is the system that I was mentioning to you earlier that we were able to do in India five years ago. Um, it's very easy to collect when women, choose, women can choose the time and place and um, you know, be that by themselves in privacy and no need for appointment or speculum. So in, in America, we have the home trial launched by the Kaiser Permanent Day folks that were able to mail these tests to women and uh, get them back and really improve the numbers of underscreened populations in this space. And there are several studies that have shown high uh, patient acceptability, several studies that have shown it is equivalent to doing a clinician connected sample. 
So there is no doubt about that evidence. And this is really not a new concept. Uh, Netherlands, Austria, and Denmark and Italy are actually using it right now uh, in their non-attender programs. Yet self-sampling in America is not widely implemented. Um, the 2018 guidelines were one of the first steps towards using uh, HPV testing, but not self-sampling. <laughs> and there is no clinical guideline right now that's incorporating that self-sampling because of the lack of FDA approval for this collection device, which has changed earlier in 2020 and is currently changing due to a trans NIH last mile initiative that I was really uh, fortunate to contribute towards in uh, coming up with a public-private partnership to launch this FDA trial that would quickly give us the evidence to start widely implementing this in the field. But when we were reviewing the guidelines, we were noticing several missed opportunities in 2018 as well. Um, in addition to women from lower socioeconomic status, from racial ethnic minorities and rural counties, we had no data about lesbian, bisexual, and transgender folks about cervical cancer. So this really prompted me to think about what is happening in New Mexico. And we saw some like mixed results in terms of like in, in certain screening behaviors. Um, I mean, you know, one of the widespread things over here is that we are not collecting systematically sexual orientation and gender identity data. I'm acknowledging that, but from the data, the limited data that we have, we have very, um, like I think the total N for this BRFSS data was like 51 people responded to this survey. And we are making an assumption for the whole state based on 51 people. So we didn't like some of my community uh, organizers didn't think that this was re reflective of their communities. So we were able to get a grant from American Cancer Society to say, can we just do a sequential mixed method study to estimate the prevalence of cancer screening behaviors in these in the residents of New Mexico from 21 to 80 years, self-identifying as sexual and gender diverse individuals, and then really hone in with focus groups with lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individual to understand what are the barriers to cervical cancer screening in these populations. So we've launched this survey just about 20 days ago, and we were very excited about using USPS for this survey. So the way we've been doing it is through their every door direct mail. So I encourage you to really look into this. It's, it's how we get those target mailers in our mailboxes, right? Like those blanket flyers that you get, uh, the whole community gets, the postman delivers to the whole community. And we were able to sh share, uh, send out postcards with QR codes for our survey through all of New Mexico. We sent out around 25,000 flyers um, through the USPS mail. Um, and of course, in, in addition to community outreach through our advisory board, and we're so proud of this, and this is like literally hot of the press, so I have to still go and dig into my data, but we've got about 1,800 responses, which just reflects that this community wants to be heard, and if we ask them, they will tell us what their issues are and what their struggles are in this, uh, in this space. So we just, you know, it's, it, it made me reflect on the fact that we call them the hard to reach populations, and they're not, we can reach them. It's just, we have to figure out a way to reach them. <laughs> um, so we are very excited about that. We are developing some educational materials with providers and incorporating healthcare system perspectives uh, such that they are pragmatically being able, that we can pragmatically implement them in federally qualified healthcare centers, which by themselves present a unique implementation context, different from integrated health systems and large healthcare systems and hoping to really think about designing multi-level strategies to promote the uptake of this work. Um, with that, it takes a village we were discussing. It's a lot of people, a lot of brainstorming, wonderful, wonderful support through so many people that have helped make some of these research agendas clear uh, for me uh, and a lot of grateful funding from uh, folks. Um, so let's connect and let's talk. I think I've done okay in terms of time. So we have like about 10 minutes for discussion, uh, but happy to answer any questions and uh, brainstorm ideas and any suggestions you may have for me to improve some of my work too. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much. That was such a rich presentation. 
and you brought up, I feel like so many good examples that bring in both the global and local with respect, respect to health equity. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I have a question, Rachel, if I may. Mm. Uh, for, well, a, a comment and a question. Uh, comment and this was terrific. I enjoyed it profoundly. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, the question is, um, if you would talk a bit more about uh, the process of creating this screening questionnaire and the role, if any, of um, the community workers in um, drafting those questions. So are you referring to the India questionnaire or the, yes, okay. So the India questionnaire actually, so one of the methodological things that I've always kept in mind is use previous validated measures, right? <laughs> Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't try to uh, figure out a new set of questionnaires. However, in this context, I was pretty wrong in this context. I'll tell you how. Because we use the WHO stepwise surveillance measure that uh, is widely used in low and middle income countries. But then we started asking some behavioral questions like, I, I, I vividly rec recollect one question, which was about salt intake in, in a common question that we have in our US and Western world, but in India, for some of these rural and tribal communities, salt intake was like usual. That is what they eat in their diet. Pickled foods was the only things that they could afford to eat in their diet. So like asking them a WHO question that said, how much is your salt intake was absolutely the wrong measure to use in this community. So we actually spent three to four months just working with pilot testing and working with our communities. And that was a wonderful uh, privilege that I had to be based in a community-based organization that understood evidence and that understood research and pilot testing and gave me three months of their personal time to re read through the 120 questions that we had come up with for this survey questionnaire. So it took a lot of, uh, I'm so glad that you, you picked up on that. And that is the same experience I've had in, in even in New Mexico. So we've adapted the Pride study uh, questionnaire and we, are, we had to do a round robin with our community advisory board, with our collaborators, with the physicians, with the researchers who've been working in these communities for a long time to like make sure that these were the way, this is the appropriate way to ask them. You know, in the national survey, there is a lot of focus on which particular Native American community do you belong in? And that was a complete no-no for my IRB. <laughs> they were like, no, you cannot do that. You cannot go into that detail. Um, or else you have to go to each of the 19 pueblos in New Mexico and get specific permission if you want to do that. And for us, that was really not the priority question. We really wanted to say for the state of New Mexico, what are the issues? So. Absolutely, a lot of thought goes into each of these projects and questionnaire development and running them through community advisory boards and collaborators and researchers. Perhaps you can share a bit more about the photo voice experience because that is amazing. Like I've, I have taken courses on that and done that work from a CBPR perspective, but it's so interesting thinking about this combined with the implementation science perspective. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, and I think that was very much rooted in the space that women were just not coming for these services because in our heads, in this community organization head, they were applying for funding continuously to provide these services free of cost. And yet ha we're having such difficulty in like promoting this to women. And, and we were sitting, I remember it was like vividly, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, we were drinking chai, the whole community, organization was sitting around and they were like, um, what should we do? Like, I was trying to have this brainstorming discussion, you know, with a very community uh, CBPR approach with them, like, what should we do about this? And, and they said, you know, we should ask the women, right? And I was like, okay, we can ask the women. But then like another senior person was like, you ask the woman, they'll tell you the same things, like time barrier, like time, uh, money and, you know, these issues, but you never get to the root of the issue, which is the identity of a woman in India and what she can do and what she cannot do in this space. As we are becoming a modern India, 
and we are hoping that women can make decisions on their own and come and like seek care for their own bodies. That's not the reality in so many of these communities. And so that's when we were like, what if we gave them cameras? What if we give them like cameras to show what their realities are in their community? And I had never done a photo voice project. And I was like, whoa, this came from the community. <laughs> so of course the next 15 days were left in like me researching what is photo voice. So, I mean, I'd learned it through grad school. I had, I had collaborators who had done it. I had like played a small role in a grad study, but it was like, in America, <laughs> like, I was like, how am I going to do this in India? And um, we were able to, I think we had like a small trial run that we did, which was to reflect on um, a public health problem in the community. So the lack of water was a, was a real important issue in some of these communities. So we did a trial run with like 10 people to say, okay, tell us that, tell, show us how, lack of water in this community, like running, lack of sustainable running water, right? Consistent running water. They used to get water only for like four hours in the day. So like, how does that affect your day-to-day -day lives? And so that gave us some sort of a pilot understanding to how to frame what we are expecting from them, how to do an ethics training with them, because we didn't only want people to reflect uh, everything in a negative light, but how, what's the positive behind it? What is an action that we can take about this? What can somebody do something? How can somebody do something about this? So that took like that three months of like back and forth of data collection, sitting down with them, showing them on the laptop, this is the picture you clicked. What do you think of that? So we used to, we did the show technique. So show me what's happening. How can we change this? Uh, what are some specific action steps we can take about this? So that process was an iterative process. It didn't just happen one time. And, uh, but what I saw for me, which I, I wish I had captured this through some measure, that's like the scientist brain, right? <laughs> but I wish we could have captured the, the empowerment in these 14 women that happened by the end of this as they discussed these issues and as they realized what this meant for their, their community and their, the women in their community. And what, it's amazing to see that they are now the peer educators for this community organization when we have these community camps or clinics to, to promote uh, cervical cancer screening in these communities. So I've been thinking a lot about that, like how do we capture that community empowerment that happens through these projects? Um, Alejandro, yes, we did publish this and that's in the, I can also tell you that seven journals rejected my paper <laughs> before somebody accepted it. <laughs> um, it's very hard to write this up. It was uh, primarily, I think my, I wanted to capture all of it. <laughs> and I was like, just, just kind of give me more than 3000 words to do this, please. Um, but I think we've at least gotten the first one out and we want to like start writing about the process and methods about this for implementation research. Um, I think it has contributed more to dissemination of the educational materials because what has happened is these, these action steps became more of the messages that our community organization was able to incorporate in their own educational trainings and motivational trainings or one-on-one -on -one motivation that they did for the women. And we have to still reflect on what does this mean for implementation of these services and like, you know, because the healthcare system and the religion intersection, we didn't even touch that data as much because that is a whole different Pandora's box that we were like, what do we do with this? There was so much rich data. So if you guys have uh, <laughs> some spare time on your <laughs> plates, <laughs> we would, I would love to think about it together if there are other folks that are interested in similar methods to apply to your context. This was really, really rich and amazing. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. And